Hello, everyone, and welcome to the MIT IoT seminar series, where this semester we're focusing on technologies for the ocean Internet of Things. It is my great pleasure today to introduce Dr. Julien Bonal. Dr. Bonal is an associate scientist at, with tenure at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, where his research focuses on signal processing and underwater acoustics, including time frequency analysis, source detection and localization, geoacoustic inversion, acoustic tomog tomography, passive acoustic monitoring and bioacoustics. Uh, and he will be sharing with us today some of his exciting work in this space. Before joining HUI, Dr. Bonnell received his PhD in signal processing from uh, Grenoble Institute, Institut National Polytechnique in France uh, in 2010. And from 2010 to 2017, he was an assistant, uh, then associate professor at the Ecole Nationale Supérieure de Technique Avancée de Bretagne. I hope my French is working well, Julien. Um, uh, he has won many awards, uh, including the 2019 A.B. Wood Medal from the Institute of Acoustics in the United Kingdom and the 2020 R. Bruce Lindsay Award from uh, the Acoustic Society of America. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today, Julien, and the screen is yours. Thanks a lot, Fadel. And your French accent is nearly as good as my English accent. So <laughs> thanks for the effort. Um, so hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here today. I'm you know, happy, delighted to do that presentation. Uh, it's exciting to speak in front of you today. Um, um, so I will speak about uh, acoustical oceanography with a single sensor. And I'll try to cover propagation, processing, and application. And I think that one important piece of contact context today is the single hydrophone application um, because you know in the context of ocean iot uh, we'll need processing that are simple enough to be embedded into uh, relatively simple uh, autonomous platforms so i believe that you know our good old ray processing uh, may not be as relevant uh, as it used to be for iot application so that's hence the single hydrophone application today uh, before I dive into technical details. I figure out, you know, I can start with a quick overview of underwater acoustics on acoustical oceanography. I cannot hurt. Um, I think we can divide uh, this field into some kind of, you know, two broad uh, topic. Uh, the first one is the direct problem. And direct problem is, you know, for a given environment, how do we uh, understand and predict uh, the sound propagation and the scattering of the sound at sea? Uh, it's not that easy uh, because the ocean is a complex medium. It's varying both in time and space uh, at multiple scales uh, and it's undergoing global and rapid change. Uh, if we can solve the direct problem, we may be interested in the inverse problem. And the inverse problem is, you know, starting from acoustic data collected at sea, how we can use that to infer oceanic, oceanographic information. Uh, historically, that used to be a native problem. You know, I want to localize and detect submarines. That's the historic application. But no, it has extended to many, many other problems. Uh, we can do, you know, physical oceanography, try to infer information about the water column. Meteorology, like the sea surface, is changing, for example, because of wind and precipitation. We can use the noise to estimate the weather condition. Uh, we're interested in geoacoustic property of the seafloor, and we can also do marine biology, uh, you know, from plankton to marine mammals, basically. Uh, obviously, to do that, uh, we need uh, a lot of different uh, science topics. Uh, that includes acoustics, oceanography and marine biology, signal processing and communication, and marine instrumentation. I will not cover everything today. Uh, well, first of all, I don't know about everything. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll try to speak about what I know. Uh, that includes inverse problem, uh, so estimation of seabed properties and marine mammals localization, uh, and mostly about acoustics and signal processing. Uh, I'll narrow down the, the, the scope of the talk to uh, what happened in shallow coastal water, and um, by, you know, coastal shallow water, I mean water depths about 100 meters, out of magnitude 100 meter. Uh, I will speak mostly about low frequency sources, so, you know, frequency below a few hundred herbs. Um, my operational context is a single hydrophone, a source somewhere, on the range between the source and the receiver, which is, you know, more than a kilometer or less than tens of kilometers. Um, if you scale that cartoon to the good scale, uh, you actually obtain that blue line here. Uh, you know, that, that blue line here is up to a scale factor, basically 100 meter times 10 kilometer. So what you can imagine is that, uh, you know, the sound propagation, the mess that you saw in that cartoon is even worse in real life because what we're dealing with is really a waveguide. So if you want to do something with a single hydrophone, 
there is no escaping the physics. You need to understand the physics uh, to be able to do something. So that's the outline of the talk. Uh, I will first uh, speak about time frequency analysis. Uh, you know, it will be uh, uh, some kind of a quick review uh, to make sure that you know we have everyone on board. Um, starting with that, so that's the basic signal processing. Then I will speak about the modal propagation, that the physics that describes the context I just mentioned. And then I'll put the two together to show you how you can do adaptive processing um, for acoustic propagation in shallow water. And then I'll have two applications, uh, one about marine mammal localization, the other one about geoacoustic inversion. Uh, I'll try to cover both. If I'm short uh, with time, I'll cover just one and skip to the conclusion. So uh, I'm starting from far away, but I will not stay too long on that. Uh, I assume that everybody knows about you know, Fourier transform that gives you information about the frequency contents. Uh, for example, you know, we've got that signal here that is oscillating fast first and then slower. So high frequency in the beginning, a low frequency in the end. You do your Fourier transform, you find two spike at two frequencies. You're happy with that. The issue is that if I've got a signal, the same signal, but time reverse, uh, I obtain the same spectrum. And it's because they've got the same frequency contents. Um, so two different signals can have the same spectrum. Uh, so it, what it shows that is that what you missed is information about uh, the localization or the time of the events. So you need another representation. Uh, obviously, the information is there, but it's hidden in a phase that we usually don't look at. Um, you know, a need for another representation in signal processing usually means doing some linear algebra. Um, I will spare you the math. Uh, we need other representation. We all know other representation that shows you know, time and frequency at once. For example, this one, right? Uh, on the y axis, you've got time running. On the frequency axis, you've got something that is homogeneous to frequency, more or less. Uh, and it's something like that that we want. So uh, scientifically speaking, the easiest tool to have a time frequency representation is what is called the short time Fourier transform. The basic idea uh, is to divide the long signal into short segments of equal length. And then we do what we know how to do. On each segment, we compute a Fourier transform. And that gives us an idea of how the spectra are changing with time when we move along the segment. Um, we call that short time Fourier transform. Um, the thing to remember is that it needs a sliding window to define your segment. I told you, you slicing a signal, so we need a window to do that. Uh, and in terms of vocabulary, what we call the spectrogram uh, is the square modulus of the short time Fourier transform. Um, I want to just show you an example. Uh, there is a really cool toolbox to compute spectrogram live on MATLAB. I'm not trying a live demonstration because it always fails. So I pre-recorded myself uh, beforehand. So this is basically me doing something like something like that. So we've got time on the x-axis, frequency on the y-axis. This is my continuous tone. The frequency is not changing with time. Then this is me whistling from you know low to high pitch. And that vertical line is an impulse. It's very short in the time domain, and it's broad in the frequency domain. And this is the kind of representation that I want to use uh, to study my uh, ocean acoustic signal. No, it's not that easy, because uh, as usual with engineering, we need to find a trade-off, the best trade-off uh, to do what we want. And here, the issue is uh, what is called the time frequency re resolution. It's impossible. Uh, to have a good resolution both in time and frequency. Uh, and that is known as the Eisenberg's uncertainty principle. And I'll just illustrate that uh, with basic signal and spectrograms. And basically, the idea is that if you slide a short time window along your signal, you'll have a good time resolution. You'll know exactly what piece of the signal you're looking at. But because the window is so short, when you do your Fourier transform, you've got a poor frequency resolution. Now, if you want a good frequency resolution, you just use a long window. But when you slide that long window, it's so long that you don't know exactly what you're looking at on the signal. So you've got a good frequency resolution, but a bad time resolution. So you need to find a trade-off. Um, this is an example um, on a signal I just simulated on MATLAB. That will be my ideal time frequency representation. That's not possible in real life. That's just me drawing on four points, right? So, but it's basically an impulse, then a linear chirp, then a constant tone. Um, if I use an intermediate window, I'll obtain something like that. No, if I use a long window, you can see that I've got a good frequency resolution for my tone. I know exactly the frequency of this guy. But the price to pay is that <clears throat> no, I've got a bad time resolution for that impulse. I don't know exactly where it is. Um, <clears throat> you see here also interferences between uh, the, the impulse and the chirp. It's because my, my window was long enough that at some point, 
uh, it, it was covering the two signals at once. Um, and the other thing is that I can take a really short window, I'd have a really good time resolution, but no, my frequency resolution is not good. And obviously with real signals that are not linear, that are multiple components, uh, that will make a mess. Uh, another issue with time frequency analysis is that every time frequency resolution has interferences. Uh, this is basically a cross terms. You're computing a quadratic quantity, you have cross terms. So there's nothing you can do about that. Uh, it can be an issue to resolve two closed signals. Uh, on, there is a trade off to find between resolution and on, on, on interferences. Usually, time frequency representations that have really good resolution, they have a lot of interferences and vice versa. Um, well, there is like a zoology of time frequency representation. Uh, I'll just present the two extreme. So on one hand, you've got the spectrogram, which is the one you see on the left. Uh, it's one of the representation with the worst time frequency resolution, but it has nearly no interferences. And on the other hand, you've got the Wigner-Ville representation, which has an excellent time frequency resolution, but it has a lot of interferences. And this is just an example of a signal with a linear chirp and then a nonlinear chirp. And you can see nearly no interference on the spectrogram, but everything is super wide. That's because the resolution is, is poor. <clears throat> and then the Wigner-Ville representation on the right. Uh, if you know what you're looking for, there's an excellent resolution for along that chirp, right? And an excellent resolution here. But it has so much interferences that in real life, if I don't tell you what you're looking here, you will not find it, right? Because you will just uh, uh, look at the, you will not know what is the signal and what is the interferences. So in practice, in real life, uh, nearly everybody is using spectrograms, and that's what I will do today. Okay, enough about basic signal processing. I hope that was not too long. I, I, I hope you knew most of it already, and now I'll go to the physics. So uh, I told you I'm interested in low frequency propagation in shallow water, and when you do that, uh, you need a model which is called modal propagation. Like the usual acoustic model is the ray propagation. Uh, but that doesn't work in low frequency because like in the resolution of the wave equation, there is a high frequency hypothesis that we're really breaking here. So we need something else. And that something else is the modal propagation. So I'll try to describe modal propagation. Everything is that crazy equation here. So Y is the received signal. That term here, S is the amplitude of the source and phi sub S is the phase of the source. So that's the source term. And obviously what we have on the right is the impulse response of the waveguide. Um, so that is describing the physics of the environment. So what do we see here? We see a sum indexed by M. So we've got several modes propagating. On each mode is the product between that two phi function times these terms here. And here you see a complex exponential divided by the square root of R. So this is basically a cylindrical wave, right? With k sub M, the wave number of mod number M. And that thing here, as you see, depends exclusively on the depth of the source on the depth of the receiver. And these are called the modal depth function. This is what you see here. And basically, that modulates the amplitude of the modes depending on the source depth and depending on the receiver depth. So what is a mode? Uh, it's a cylindrical wave whose amplitude is given by the depth of the source and the depth of the receiver. And another thing that is interesting is that the wave number depends on frequency. So different frequencies will have different wave numbers. So different frequencies will propagate differently, and that is called dispersion. Uh, usually, uh, modes, they're studied with vertical line array, because this guy, the modal depth function, they're orthogonal. So if you've got enough receiver in the vertical direction, you can use their orthogonality. You can do SVD or whatever you want uh, to filter the modes. Right? This is traditional array processing for Russian acoustics. The question is, you know, if I don't have an array, if I've got a single sensor, what can I do? And obviously, the answer is you can do time frequency analysis. Uh, because um, if we look again at the equation of the modes, we can describe um, what, what, what should the propagated signal look like in the time frequency domain. So the modal phase in blue here depends on the range and depends on the wave number. And that defines the travel time. Uh, and the travel time is the position in a spectrogram. And if you look at that, this is uh, a signal uh, propagated in the Arctic, it's an organ signal, it's an impulse that's propagated over kilometers. And when we record it, we find that. Um, you see curves like that. Each curve is a mode. So they've got different propagation time, and that's because the propagation is dispersive. And the position of each mode is given by the phase of the signal. We call that dispersion curve. 
And if we are able to estimate the position of the curve, and if we know the environment, we can estimate the range of the source, obviously. Uh, know the modal, the modal amplitudes, which are given by the, the red uh, quantity. Uh, it gives the energy or the color in the spectrograms along the curve. Um, if we can estimate these amplitudes, uh, and if we know the environment well enough, we can estimate the depth of the source. Uh, obviously, the modal quantities, they're, they depend on the environment. So if we don't know the environment, we can also use the position of the modes and or the amplitude to estimate the environment as well. So if we are to do that, we need to be able to separate the modes to estimate these quantities with a single hydrophone. And obviously, in that example, that is relatively trivial because they're already separated. Now I'll show you other example, less ideal. Uh, that one is an easy signal. Uh, it's been recorded by NOAA on the, in the Arctic. Uh, it's a Balin well uh, vocalization. The source is an impulse, it's far away. Uh, it's recorded in a bearing sea, and that's what we record. You see mode one here, mode two here, mode three here, mode four here. They're nearly separated. There's not much to do here <clears throat> if you want to estimate the modes. No, what about that? That one is more difficult, right? Uh, the signal is actually here. It's an up, it's an up, an up sweep. You may see three modes, or you'll have to trust me if I tell you there are three modes there. Now, it's another Balinois vocalization. It's uh, collected on a glider by a Hui colleague. And in that specific case, if you want to separate the mode, because maybe you want to localize the Balinois, well, well, you need some serious signal processing. And that's basically the topic of the talk. So uh, <clears throat> this was the context. This was a problem. And I'll show you how you can estimate the modes in a time frequency domain when they're interfering with each other. And what I use to do that is a processing called warping. Um, I'm sure you have heard about warping, right? Uh, you know that. Uh, this is Star Trek, uh, a, TV, a TV show. And they use warping. Uh, they use warping to travel faster than light, right? Uh, but, uh, you know, I've done my literature review. I've asked NASA what they think. And they think that uh, there are many absurd theories that have become reality over the years of scientific research. But for the near future, warping remains a dream. Well, anyway, uh, you know, JAZA, the Journal of the Acoustical Society of America, doesn't think that. <laughs> uh, this is an example of a tutorial I've published a few months ago uh, about, you know, using warping for underwater acoustics. So I will speak about warping uh, and I will try to explain you how it works. So we'll go back to the Star Trek warping. Uh, the Star Trek warping is uh, I want to warp, I want to bend, to bend space so that I can travel faster. And I'll just take you a simple example, but it's explaining Star Trek. Uh, let's say you work on that house on the top left of that sheet of paper. That sheet of paper is your universe. And you travel there and you have to travel every day and it's too long and you want to make that faster. So one thing you can do is that you can warp space, you can bend it. And if you do it well, you will travel faster, right? No, if you don't do it well and you bend it the wrong way, <laughs> uh, you will not gain anything. You will even increase the length of your travel. And the lesson behind it is that if you want to do warping, you need a physical model of your space to do something that is useful. And we have to remember that. Uh, obviously, OK, enough with Star Trek. Um, in real life, uh, mathematically speaking, uh, warping is a transformation of one axis. Whether you transform your space axis or your time axis, you're transforming one axis and you hope to do something useful. Uh, warping is described with that equation here. Uh, you require a warping function, h of t. This is your model. This is how you change the shape of your space, right? And the warp signal is given by this equation. So basically what you see is that if my input, if my input signal is y, I'm doing a substitution. I replace t with h of t. This is warping space. And I've got that factor here that is just here for energy conservation, basically. The ID is just a substitution. The cool thing is that if your H is a one-to-one -one mapping, then warping is invertible. You can warp, and then you can unwarp, and you can go back and forth. Uh, and this is pretty cool, because basically what you can do is that you can warp your signal, then you can work in the warp space, and then you can come back in the same way you do for your transform one way on the other way. 
uh, once again, in real life, there's no warping. NASA is fully right with that. Um, but what you can do is that once you collect data, uh, you know, you can warp the data on your computer. It's like when you got a tape recorder in the old days, you can just, you know, forward fast. <laughs> so you can do that. Uh, in practice, um, so time warping, I'm going to speak about time warping exclusively from now. Um, so I told you it's a substitution. Uh, physically speaking, what does that mean? It means that you're stretching your time axis, you know. Uh, um, in terms of signal processing, it means that you're resampling it and potentially non-linearly resampling it. So that's an example of, you know, a continuous tone. It's just color coded so that you can see uh, the impact of warping better. But that first thing here is just, you know, compressing the signal. And once again, we conserve energy. So if we compress it, it's shorter and we make the amplitude larger. Or we can stretch it. Uh, and if we stretch it, we make the amplitude slow, uh, smaller. And what's more interesting is that we can do nonlinear warping. Uh, in this example on the right, we see it really well. Uh, we stretch it more at the beginning than at the end. And that's typically the kind of transformation that will be interesting to study uh, the acoustic signal. Uh, um, so we're now going to using warping for ocean acoustics. Uh, the aim that we give ourselves uh, is to transform every mode into continuous tones. And I'll first maybe give you an illustration. That is a spectrogram of a signal recorded in the tank. That was an easy tank experiment. Um, if you know what you're looking for, mode one is here, mode two is here, mode three is here, mode four is here. Um, they interfere with each other because they're nonlinear in time frequency domain. And since they're nonlinear, there is no good resolution that will be you know, ideal for the whole signal. So we stretch the time axis. And we hope to do it in such a way that after stretching, all the modes are continuous tones. And that means they become horizontal in the time frequency domain. And if they're horizontal, no, it's easy. We don't need a good time resolution. We just need a good frequency resolution. So no, we can, if that transformation really works, we can filter them easily. And we're lucky because um, if we look at the underlying physics, that transformation here in an ideal waveguide with a perfectly reflecting surface on the perfectly rigid seabed works for all the modes. And that's what we illustrate in that tank experiment. You know, that tank was nearly an, an, an ideal waveguide. It works really well. All the modes are already horizontal after warping. Uh, I now want to show you a movie, which obviously never works. So I'll do it like that of how warping work step by step. So what, what I'm showing you here is just you know, gradually stretching the signal until all the modes becomes horizontal. And I'll start again. So that's the beginning with the signal that is you know, non warp and then I'm stretching the signal. And what you see is that you don't need to stretch a lot to have the mode separated, right? If I stop here, my modes are not horizontal, but they're separated enough, right? Much more separated than in the beginning. And if I stretch a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, then in the end, that becomes perfect uh, continuous tones. I'll just wait on, on them to become nearly perfect continuous tones. OK, enough. Um, so that was you know, an example on an ideal tank situation. Now the question is, how does that work at sea? And how can we use that to actually filter the modes? So I'll do both at once, showing you an example at C and explain how we use that to filter the modes. The filtering scheme is presented here. Basically, we've got a receive signal with the modes that are not well resolved. We warp it. And then since each mode is nearly a continuous tone, we can do filtering. You can do time frequency filtering. You can nearly do filtering in a frequency domain. And then everything you do one way, you do the other way. You can unwarp, and then you've got your filter modes. So this is an example of an ergon signal. So that's the source they use for oil and gas exploration. It's doing nice impulses. Recorded in a North Sea, like I don't remember, seven kilometers away, something like that. This is my spectrogram. You see the modes, you see the interfere together. And you do your warping and you obtain something like that. So obviously my, my model of the physics, my ideal wave guide, it's not good enough to fully describe the North Sea. So my modes are on a perfect horizontal line. They're bananas or whatever. But it's good enough that you know, they're more separated than what they used to be. And no, I can do my time frequency filtering. I can, you know, I can just do a threshold or whatever I want to focus on one mode. So right, what I have here is one mode after warping filtered in the time frequency domain, okay? 
and I can undo everything. I can go back to the time domain. So this is the time series of a given mode warp, right? And you can see that you know by eye the frequency is nearly constant. It's 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 in the, the warp domain. Then you unwarp, and you've got the time series of a filter mode. And by eye, you see that you know it oscillates faster in the beginning than at the end. So it must have that shape. So it looks good, right? Uh, obviously, you don't have to trust me. <laughs> um, if you don't trust me, what you do is that you compute a spectrogram again. You see the shape of that guy. Uh, it looks good again. Uh, the cool thing is that no, we've got a single signal, a single mode. So we don't have a lot of interference issues between modes. So we can do better on spectrogram. We can do, for example, a related spectrogram, and we obtain the position of this guy in the time frequency domain. And what we did for one mode, we can do for all the mode individually. Um, so we can you know, have a good estimates of every mode individually, put them together. And you can go from you know, original spectrogram to what we did, and it seems to work really well. Um, and if you want to estimate the dispersion curve, that was kind of my topic in the beginning, like the position of the mode in the time frequency domain, I call dispersion curves, and it carries information about the range and about the environment. Well, you do your model filtering using warping. You do your relocated spectrogram or whatever else. And then mode by mode, you estimate the time arrivals of the mode using peak picking or whatever simple method you want. And that's an example on the, on the North Sea arrogant signal. Uh, you obtain that black line. On the black line, you can use to estimate the range of the source or the waveguide parameters. OK, so I'll start with the uh, application now. So I'm going to start with the some bioacoustics application, and notably Balinwell application. So in a sense, uh, if you've done your model filtering, localization is easy because you can use whatever method that exists in the literature. People have been doing that forever, except that they've been using arrays to filter the modes, right? And then they've developed match mode processing or things like that. So you can use any of the methods developed for arrays. Um, if you're hunting only for range, uh, the only thing that you need is the study the phase of the mode. So you can propagate the phase, or you can estimate the time of arrival and use that uh, to localize the animal. If you look both for range and depth, uh, you need to use both the phase and the amplitude of the signal. Basically, that's what match mode processing is doing. Of, for all these methods, the common requirement is that you need at least two modes, because basically you compare the modes with each other. On more mode is better. Uh, you need common frequencies between modes, and you need environmental knowledge. You need to know notably about the seafloor because the seafloor impacts the propagation. And if you don't know the seafloor, you cannot predict the modes, and thus you cannot uh, localize your animals. And in practice, we don't know the seafloor. <laughs> so what you do uh, is that you have to invert for the seafloor parameter at the same time that you estimate the localization of the animal. But here. Uh, if we care about the animal and we don't care about the seafloor, we don't need an accurate vision of the seafloor. We just need a model that is you know, good enough to predict propagation, even if it's not physically realistic, um, you know, good enough to estimate the range. So I'll give you an example with Bohedwell. That was a, a project uh, that is a bit old now uh, that I did with Aaron Todd from Scripps. Uh, we study Bohedwell vocalization in the Beaufort Sea. Uh, that is the north, somewhere in the north coast of Alaska. Uh, the water is shallow, 50 meter. Basically, you know, we've got data set with you know less than five modes. This is an example of a spectrogram of a of a bowhead well. You see three modes, and you see that they're different from each other. So there is indeed dispersion, and we can use all that processing. Uh, the cool thing is that um, in terms of instrument at sea, there was a vertical line array here. That's the the green diamond, and I used just a single sensor of the VLA on all this red thing were directional sensor. So we can use the distributed network uh, to localize the animal, to have a ground truth, and double check that what we do with a single sensor is relevant. Because that's one big issue when you're localizing marine mammal. You know, if you come with new methods, you need a ground truth. <laughs> you, you, you need something to say, yes, I'm, I'm relatively correct. Um, I'm just showing you a few examples of, of various Bainwell codes that we've been using. Uh, you know, just illustrating that you know some have like good signal to noise ratio, some have bad signal to noise ratio. Uh, sometimes the modes are you know, nearly separated. Sometimes it's a mess. So, just a few examples of what we did, and that's an example of the res on, on the result that we get. I'll just illustrate maybe you know maybe call eight. We can all look at that one. Uh, so that green dot is the VLA. Once again, I use a single sensor. 
that green circle is my range estimate. That's the output. Um, we compare that with what we call ground truth. And the ground truth is the estimate from the distributed array on each sensor was directional. So each directional sensor estimate a B ring, that's a blue line. And then we cross all the B ring, and that gives us the lack long position of the animal. We've got an uncertainty if we want, that's the black ellipse. And you can see that for all the calls, we do as well with a single sensor, or maybe as bad as what can be done with a distributed network of directional sensor. So it shows that there is really information. Uh, we can range source uh, at sea uh, using simple single sensor processing. Um, OK, uh, another example uh, about North Pacific Rite 12. Um, another project with Aronta from Scripps. Uh, it's a data collected uh, in a Bering Sea. And in this example, we were interested in estimating the depths of the animal using the same method, but estimating the depths. Um, I mean, that's an interesting example because nothing worked as we wanted. <laughs> it's good to uh, you know, acknowledge that sometimes. Uh, we, is that a question or should I go on? I'll just go on, okay. Um, one of the issue is that the sun's peak profile in the Arctic is heavily downward refracting during summer. And what that means is that the physical model that we use for warping uh, was not good enough anymore. So we had terrible issue to estimate the modes for frequency higher than 100 Hertz. Uh, and that means that we had issue uh, finding data with exclusively North Pacific high 12. So in the end, we still had a, a small data set with like 20 gunshots. So those are impulsive sources from North Pacific high 12s and 12 up calls from high 12. And we, we, we did that processing, warping, and then match mode processing, and we estimated uh, the depth of the of that calls. And we show that there is a statistically different distribution for the source depths of the calls of these animals, of, of these specific calls, the gunshot and the up call. Um, it's the first time that this kind of measurement was done on North Pacific High 12. Um, similar results were obtained on North Atlantic High 12. But to obtain this calling depth results on the North Atlantic population, what they did is that they tagged the animal. They were they physically went on, you know, put a sensor on the marine mammal to estimate the depth. So here we show that once again with a simple single hydrophone method, uh, we can do uh, interesting um, marine mammal application. Okay, that's it about marine mammal. Now I will speak about uh, geoacoustic inversion. So geoacoustic inversion is estimating the seafloor properties. Uh, between a source and a receiver. And that is that is super important. That is super important for at least two reasons. First of all, you know, once again, the Navy, <laughs> they need it, they need it. Uh, and they need it because you need to know the seafloor property if you want to be able to simulate the propagation. And you need to be able to simulate the propagation if you want to assess your sonar performance. So if you want a good assessment of your performances, you need to know the seafloor. So that's important for the Navy. Uh, it's not. It's also important for many other people. For example, we know right now that the noise we do at sea, uh, we being humans, you know, oil and gas exploration, marine traffic, sonar system, uh, it's a pollution. It's impacting the environment. And you know, if stakeholders want to monitor that, want to forecast the noise pollution, they need to be able to simulate the propagation. And once again, as the Navy, if they want to simulate the propagation, they need to know about the seafloor. So they need to do geoacoustic inversion. Otherwise. Uh, the noise forecast will be meaningless. So we need to know about seafloor properties. Um, how we do that, uh, we, can do, we can do that several ways, but basically we have to solve uh, an optimization problem. Um, what I want to present today is what is called transdimensional Bayesian inversion. So I'll start maybe with just Bayesian inversion. The idea is that not only you want to find the seafloor property, but you want to find uh, the underlying um, probability distribution of the, your parameters so that you can properly assess uncertainty. And once again, that is important for the application. So basically, you want to estimate the probability of your parameters x given your data. And that is given by, it's the base rule, the prior information that you have about your parameters, which you update using the likelihood, the match between um, the data on, on, on the prediction. Um, this is a traditional Bayesian inversion. Now, when you do trans-D inversion, uh, there's another trick, is that it's 
it's that your what you try to estimate uh, also contains many models. Like the, the size of what you estimate is also an unknown. So in, in this case, for example, not only we want to estimate uh, seafloor parameters uh, inside sediment layers, we also want to estimate the number of sediment layers. Um, so, so the size of the parameter space is an unknown. So in that specific case, we want to estimate K, for example, the number of seafloor layer on the associated geoacoustic parameters for that number of layers given the data. And once again, the same rule uh, that combines uh, the prayer that you have and the likelihood. And in our case, the data is the dispersion curve of the modes. Um, you know, that is not a trivial problem to solve. Uh, first of all, there are computational issues. You're trying to do sampling into space that, are, that can be high dimension. Uh, it's not trivial, numerically speaking. Um, another problem is that if you want to define that likelihood properly, uh, you need statistical hypothesis or knowledge. But usually we don't have knowledge about that, so we need hypothesis. Um, so we need hypothesis about the data error statistics. What we do here is that we assume that they're unbiased, they're Gaussian distributed, they're independent between modes. Uh, for a given modes, they can be correlated from one frequency to the next. We estimate that from the data. Um, a posteriori, we double check all the hypotheses. Um, so I'll apply that to a specific data set. Uh, it's a data set that have been collected in 2017 on your New England mud patch, basically 100 kilometers south from me right now. <laughs> um, so that was a big experiment. I don't have time to detail everything. I'll just detail what, what is interesting for that talk. The source was a combustive sound source. It's basically an impulsive source with bubble pulse. It's not perfectly impulsive. It, it has bounces. Uh, the receiver um, was a large array. I'm using just uh, the vertical line array right here. And I'll tell you why I'm using a vertical line array and not a single sensor later. Uh, the range is a bit more than five kilometers. There was a seismic survey uh, on that experimental area. So we know uh, we have an ID of the sub bottom layering. <clears throat> um, you know, we know that there is that is a seafloor. That is a so-called mud base and then sun base and, and other reflectors that we don't know exactly what they are. I'm showing you that to show you that you know it's as range independent as it gets in real life. So it's in this specific case, uh, it's reasonable to use a range independent acoustic propagation model. Uh, um, this is a spectrogram of a received signal after source deconvolution. And what I've done is that I've used the VLA to estimate modes at various depths. And by changing depths, uh, that basically change the signal to noise ratio of modes. Um, I've been allowing myself to choose the receiver depths that I want for each mode so that I've got the best estimate of the modes. So I haven't done array processing, but I've used you know, the vertical variability uh, to get a better estimate of my modes. Um, that in the end allowed me to estimate dispersion curve for up to 21 modes from 20 to 550 curves. Um, you know, I mean, if you're not in the ocean acoustic fields, like 21 modes, you may not care. <laughs> but you know, the usual number was something like you know less than five. So that's that's kind of a big deal for the community. Uh, and then I use that black curve uh, as an input to solve my inverse problem. And um, since I'm since I'm doing everything in that trans Bayesian world. Uh, what I obtain is uh, posterior probability density profile. Uh, on the left, uh, this is the probability to have an interface uh, versus depth. In the middle, that's the sound speed probability versus depth. So if it's warm, red, it means high probability. If it's uh, cold, blue, it means low probability. And if it's white, it means nearly zero. Uh, this is sound speed. This is density. Uh, the horizontal black line are uh, the, the depths from the interface from the seismic survey. So we're not using that in the inversion, but that gives us an idea of the so-called ground truth or as, 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 <laughs> as much as we are from the ground truth. And you see that you know it, it kind of seems consistent. Uh, we'll zoom on the first layer that was supposed to be homogeneous mud. Uh, and that was kind of the interest for that experiment. And what you see is that uh, we find layers within the mud. Um, that originally came as a surprise. Uh, and we see that the sound speed profile is increasing uh, a bit within the mud. That came as a surprise. 
And there's also a big jump of sound speed above the so-called noise layer. Um, you know, in the beginning, that was a surprise. And now it has been confirmed by uh, other independent analysis, other experiments, including coring, actually, you know, physically sampling the mud. And um, we now believe that this is true. And I think this is a good demonstration of how important it is um, to, you know, assess uh, the data information content of your data uh, and to let the data speak about the model parametrization that you need, not necessarily trust uh, blindly uh, whatever information that you have. Because in this case, um, the, the resolution of the seismic survey is fully different from the resolution of the long range acoustic data, and we have different vision. Uh, and if you were to assess propagation in this frequency at long range, you need a model like that. You cannot just use the layering from the seismic survey. Uh, when you do inversion, another thing that you have to do is always double check uh, the, the match uh, you know, by eye between uh, your data, uh, the observation. So in this case, that's, these are the black cross on the prediction of the inversion. And in this case, uh, these are the red line. And you see that we've got a really, really good match uh, for all the modes. So that, that's a good hint that uh, the model that we have at the output of the inversion um, explain the data really well. Um, so I'll conclude. Um, I think, I, I hope I've kind of convinced you that uh, single hydrophone data contain more information that we sometimes think. Uh, obviously, you know, uh, if you're doing a big ocean acoustic experiment and if you can deploy arrays, just do it, it's better. <laughs> but if you cannot, you know, maybe if you're working on IoT networks and on, on, on you want small platforms, uh, you can do stuff with single sensor. Uh, obviously, there is a price to pay, <laughs> the price to pay signal processing. Um, so you need advanced signal processing to obtain information from a single hydrophone, and you need signal processing to characterize performances on uncertainties. Uh, this is important. Don't forget the uncertainty about what you do. Uh, you also need to understand the physics. Uh, I've showed you that uh, low frequency propagation um, in shallow weather is described by modal propagation. Uh, in terms of signal processing, it means that the signal is multi-component. Uh, it has, uh, the, the propagation is dispersive, so there are multiple nonlinear group delays in a, in a given signal. But that dispersion is both wonderful and terrible. Uh, you know, on one hand, it characterizes the propagation, both the source position and the environment. On the other hand, it makes the receive signal uh, complex. So the solution is physics-based signal processing. Uh, you can do single hydrophone processing. Uh, so far, uh, you know, the warping I showed you, it requires an expert. Uh, sometimes it works, sometimes it does not work. Uh, we know why, we know when. And what we're doing right now is, you know, try to replace the human in the loop um, by um, machine learning methods. And that, I think, will push us more toward the IoT uh, world. So that's work in progress. And there are MIT students working on it. And, you know, I'll be excited to speak about that maybe <laughs> next year or in a few years. Uh, that's all I have. Uh, I didn't pay attention. I don't know if I said I or we during the talk, but that was collaborative work. Uh, nothing would have been possible without the help of many colleagues, postdoc students, and obviously uh, without the financial support of uh, many sponsors. Um, that's all I have. Uh, I guess if we have time, uh, I can take questions. Wonderful. Thank you very much, uh, Julien. Very exciting work. Uh, I'm sure we have questions. So one thing that I'm going to do now is uh, also allow folks to unmute themselves and to start their videos if they want to ask questions. So anyone can unmute themselves. Um, if you also want, you can ask questions in, uh, in chat, and I'd be happy to relay them to Julien. I can try uh, to monitor the chat if you need it. Uh, no. Great. And if anyone wants to ask a question, you can unmute and ask. Jack? Yeah, I have a question. Um, <clears throat> so in the modal propagation equation, um, why exactly do you need two functions, like one for the depth of the source and one for the depth of the um, receiver? Why, why would you not just encapsulate those into one like amplitude function? Well, I guess it, it, uh, you, you, you can. I mean, you, you, you can call that big, you, you can call that thing here. You know, you can enca encapsulate that under the big capital A if you want. And, you know, from the signal processing point of view, that's what we do. 
yeah. from the physics point of view, uh, that's not what we do because this psi have, have a meaning. Like you compute, basically, if you work in a given wave guide, you compute the wave number on the modal depth function independently of the source position. So that's okay. what you get out of a model from the physics. And then how you combine that uh, is up to you, in a sense. Okay, okay. We can also take other, Walid. Yeah, so, uh, hi, Julian, thank you for the talk. Uh, I really liked it. And I, I just have one question about why do you need to restrict the frequencies below 500 hertz? Like, why is that the case? Is it because of the channel uh, that you are not considering high frequencies? Okay, so the, the, the higher the frequency, for a given water depth, the higher the frequency, the more modes that you have. I um, see. The more, on, on all the modes are, I mean, the wave number, they're basically constrained uh, in a given part of the space of the wave number space between basically omega over mean speed and omega over max speed. So the more mode that you have, the closer they are from each other. And at some point, if there are two more, you know, if there are too many modes and they're too close from each other with single sensor, there's just nothing you can do. So that's, that's the idea. If there are too many modes, um, it, it, it doesn't work. And it's uh, what, what matters is not um, the absolute frequency. Uh, it's basically, it's more a ratio of the wavelengths over the water depths. So you can scale, basically you can scale the problem. You know, if you, if you divide frequency by 10 and you increase water depths by a factor of 10, you've got the same number of modes. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Walid. Uh, Irina, Irina, you had a question. Um, hi, thank you for the talk. Um, I just asked it in the chat. Um, I was curious, so kind of following up on that question, under what conditions is that possible? Um, and in particular, can you envision that being extended to terrestrial bioacoustics or, or not really? <laughs> thank you. Um, uh, so, we need what we need is we need to be able to model the propagation with that modal propagation model which i showed um so for marine bioacoustics uh, it means that um, we need the environment not to be changing too fast like you know in in the example i showed uh, Um, let me go back there. So for example, here, the receiver was in 50, 50 meter of water and we had animal up to maybe that were localized around here. So that's 30 meters of water. That, that, that's a significant change in water depth. You know, that's nearly 50% of change. Uh, if the environment was changing faster than that, um, the simple model that we use uh, will not work. So if there are a few propagation nerves in the audience, we need uh, the adiabatic approximation to hold. Uh, if there are couple modes, it doesn't work. Uh, in simple words, it means the environment has to be gentle enough that a simple model is working. If it's changing drastically, if there is a cement, a cement between the source and the receiver, it doesn't work. All right. So you, you need that to be the environment to be gentle enough. Um, will that work in terrestrial acoustics? Uh, I guess no, because you will or. I don't see a context where you will have a waveguide like that. You know, that has been applied, the same kind of method have been applied in, for example, biomedical. Like, you know, you propagate ultrasounds in a plate. Uh, that's a waveguide, you've got normal modes and the same kind of methods can be applied. Um, in air, I, I don't see that, but, you know, uh, I for sure do not know everything in that field. Uh, Glenny had a question. Yes, perfect. Thank you so much. A super duper interesting talk. I have two questions. The first is just more a little bit more basic of whether so I'm assuming you were probably using MATLAB for all of this, but I was wondering if you can also warp in other acoustic analysis software like in Raven or R or using R Raven. And then the other question that I had was um, so when you say that there are different ways to conduct or like different transformations will work in different warp transformations will work in different contexts. So I'm wondering if that's specific to each environment and you kind of create the 
right transformation, and then you can do it for multiple de hydrophone deployments, or if that's for a specific biologic signal. And so, for example, like a boat noise or a cetacean sound, you may have to retransform the data to see the modes best. Okay, so I'll yeah. answer the first question first. So uh, about software. Um, so there are two, two answers to that. The first thing is that you need to filter the modes um, in using that warping approach. And to do that, uh, you need whatever software that allows you to do some advanced signal processing. I'm using MATLAB, you can use Python. Uh, I'm pretty sure you can use maybe, you know, other, maybe Julia or whatever. I mean, stuff that allows you to really manipulate the signal. If you're thinking about, uh, you know, bioacoustic software like Raven or Audacity or whatever, uh, that is a no because they don't allow you to do that. The only thing that may allow you is maybe, you know, basic detection or basic filtering, but, uh, you know, you need full control of your signal, uh, which you don't have with the traditional bioxic software. Um, also, to solve the inversion problem, uh, the marine mammal is an easy one. It's optimization in you know, five dimension, maybe. Uh, MATLAB is fine for that. Um, the, the geoacoustic inversion is like you know, sampling, MCMC -MC sampling in a space that goes from you know, 10 dimension to 50 dimension. Uh, I would not use MATLAB for that. Um, in that case, everything is coded in Fortran. Uh, but you know, once again, whatever language that you master uh, is will, will will do the trick. But you need something fast. Uh, well, you need something fast on one end, and you also need something that is able to call your propagation model, uh, which may be an issue because we don't have that many propagation model available uh, in the community. That was the first question. Uh, I do not remember the second. I'm sorry. Can you repeat the second question? It was just about if you when you find the correct way to transform or warp if it's for the specific deployment location or for the specific type of sound that you're looking for. So the that's kind of the that's kind of the beauty about warping is that it's always the same transformation, which is basically that. Um, you can basically apply it with you know I on that, I think I always take R equal five kilometers and C equal fifteen hundred, so it. Be, because because it, it, it scales itself in a sense, so you, you can use that transformation nearly all the time. There is one trick uh, which I didn't touch here. Uh, the, the difficult trick uh, is that you need to find the beginning of the signal. That will make a big change. Like you know, what is the when I when I stretch my signal, you know, I need to hold it on the left side, and where do I hold it? That's that's an important one. Um, and then the question about maybe the kind of signal. Um, it works on, so that, that's also something I didn't say, but you know, all the theory I presented about warping is assuming that you work uh, on a sound signal that is an impulse. Uh, if the sound signal is not an impulse, like what we have here for a marine mammal, uh, the first trick that we do is that we make it impulsive by, you know, we guess the source, uh, we guess the source low. That is just basically a trial uh, on error by an expert that is time consuming. Uh, that is why I say we need machine learning. <laughs> um, and then you know we make it we make it as if it's impulsive. And you know, if it's good enough, we can apply warping. That's what we did in that case. Uh, long signals like sheep noise uh, will not work. Um, there are, you know, uh, there are articles in the literature, not in, notably in the Chinese literature, they've been applying that on the autocorrelation of the signal. Uh, on, 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 on it seems it's working in the autocorrelation of, of the signal, uh, which opens also a new avenue to apply that for a broader range of signals. Um, I've never tried myself. Um, thanks, Julian. We had a question from Aaron in the chat. In the geoacoustic and inversion, do you assume that the mud layers are flat in range? Yes, yes, we do. Uh, so that's, that's the, the assumption that we do. The assumption that we do is that we've got a stack of homogeneous range independent layers. And we vary the number of layers, but we assume that that does not change between the source and the receiver. Um, if we know it's changing, uh, or if we know that it's not range independent, there are tricks we can play, but I haven't shown any of that today and it becomes more complicated, obviously. Great. Thanks. Okay, I have a few questions. Um, so when you talked about uh, experiment in the tank, and you said it's a perfect waveguide at the top and the bottom, but the tank also has sides. 
So your, I mean, these sites could also act as the waveguide, but I was wondering if that is also taken into account. No, because they were uh, with the with the size of the tank, and you know, we 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 choose the setup in a way that uh, we didn't. I mean, the, anything coming from the side will come so late that it was naturally cut out. Uh, I see. So yeah. it's it's flat. But what if you were to have sides? Wouldn't that also be part of the waveguide? It's like a standing wave. Yeah, yeah, but it, it's so it's it's if you work in a tank, uh, it's a different modal propagation. Uh, it's more right. you enter. I mean, it's an enclosed room, and you you enter the room the, the the realm of room acoustics basically. Uh, and you've got yeah, you've got a set of modes that creates resonances. Uh, it's a indeed a different. It's indeed another kind of waveguide, but it's a different physics. Um, um, it's pretty well described in room acoustic book. Okay. Uh, yeah, you work in tanks, right? <laughs> Um, another question for you is, you talked about sub 500 hertz and also like shallow depth, where shallow depth is about 50 meters. Yeah. But I assume the same thing also works if you're working at like um, four meters of depth, but over like 10 meters of communication. Is that correct? Like it's sort of orders of magnitude. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, an, an order of magnitudes where it worked well is like, you know, the water depth being 100 meter. Uh, the frequency being 100 hertz on the range being like 10 kilometers and you can scale that like oh, you know sorry. From, can you come again what are what are the orders of magnitude so 100 meter for water depths uh 100 hertz for the source on um, 10 kilometers for the range you know these are just wrong numbers but that's basically that's a context where you've got between five and ten volts um, and uh, you can scale you can scale everything if you increase the frequency by a factor of two and you decrease the range by a factor of two, and you decrease the water depth by a factor of two, you've got exactly the same waveguide. Exactly, right? If you scale everything. Um, I, I've worked on an example where I was working in like 10 meter of water on frequency or kilohertz, and that works really well. The trick is really- 10 meters of water, yeah. It was that, um, okay, so at, at one kilohertz. So another question for you is, um, you talked mainly about Sort of an uncooperative source and i yes. was wondering whether this or some of the the analysis here also works for communication like if you do have a cooperative source that might or might not be transmitting a a signal with a preamble that you might know as well so in this geoacoustic inversion example that was a cooperative source uh, for example we needed we use the source waveform to do source deconvolution in that specific example uh, to work on the impulse response of the waveguide. Um, um, the thing is that I think with the, you know, with that low frequency context, uh, we're not really into a regime that is, yeah, you know, friendly to underwater acoustic communication. Uh, maybe the long range stuff that they do, but I, I don't know much about. Um, well, I mean, one question there is in coastal environments or rivers or lakes, these things like you have uh, the orders of magnitude that you talk about also work there. And so it becomes actually very harsh to communicate in these environments. I was wondering whether this can also help in communication, not just in channel estimation, because if you're able to do channel estimation, then you might be able to, to communicate. And then you might be able to. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's that's an excellent question or suggestions or comments. Um, yeah, yeah I, I never look at, the, at these kind of environments, but yeah, I think if, the, if you can scale the problem, then yes. The one last question that I have for you is, you're assuming all of this is with an impulse response. So it just transmits and then it stops transmitting, right? And so the channel is also assumed to be stationary of, of whatever orders that you need to care about, which is why you are saying, oh, you need adiabatic propagation, right? As, as opposed to the channel is not changing. It's pretty, yeah, okay, it's, it's pretty interesting because again, thinking about it in terms of communication or in even shallower waters, then the slight waves that are happening at the top, then the channel itself starts changing. But I think there's a lot of interesting sort of uh, um, applications of this in for higher throughput communication in shallow water under unknown environments. Pretty exciting yeah. stuff. On, on to maybe to answer that a bit. Uh... With the frequency, I mean, in a traditional 
context where I'm working, you know, like frequency below a few hundred hertz, propagation range about more than a few kilometers. Uh, the wavelengths are big enough that you need serious, serious change to see. <laughs> to, you need serious change to really affect the signal. That's one thing. Uh, the other thing is that people have been using this very same methods to do water column tomography. And, um, you know, if the source is doing ping, 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 you estimate the channel for each ping, and then you look at how it moves. Uh, that 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 you can do for sure. Uh, no, if the channel is. But then you have to ping. Mm -hmm. But you have to ping a lot. Like there's. You have a to ping a lot. Yeah, you have to ping a lot. Yeah. You yeah, have to. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. I think there, there might be opportunities. Get, what you're talking about is like not so cooperative source. Yeah. So maybe you can start tracking it over time, uh, because you're using such so little so little help from the transmitter in general. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that, that's right. But if so you, you might to... increase the throughput, which is so important given that the bandwidth of underwater acoustics is so precious and sort of small. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, yeah, great. Wonderful. Very exciting. Thanks for answering my questions. No problem, my pleasure. And everyone's questions as well. Um, yeah, with well, this, we'll wrap up the, the open uh, seminar. Uh, thank you very much uh, for joining us. It, uh, I'm assuming. Uh, we're done with questions. If anyone has questions, please feel free to um, email Julian directly. Um, and um, yeah, thank you so much for joining us. Very exciting work. So many applications. John, you had a comment or to question? say thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome.